So it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Harel Patel, our speaker today, who is a lecturer and architect at Cardiff University. Harel's research and teaching aims to better understand the needs of users of the built environment. Her PhD research theorizes the practices of adapting academic library buildings, and she's also designed a framework to better align learning spaces with curriculum. Her talk today is titled The Building is Never Complete, A Tale of Space, Users and Technologies. There's also a list, a selection of um, uh, Harrell's publications listed on the DSF um, web pages. So if this inspires you to go find out more um, about her work afterwards, it's some things to get you started. So I'll hand over to Harrell now. Thanks very much. So a lot of my work and, and, and kind of insights that I will be sharing with you today uh, comes from uh, my PhD research at University of Reading between 2012 and 2016. And I just wanted to um, put, that, put it out there that it is very situated research. So um, my focus was looking at this one building and, and, and trace the evolution of that building over, over 50 years at that time and now more. And um, it, 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 when I started this project, uh, my research, I didn't realize the, the kind of complexities of adapting library buildings. Um, but it was through working with, uh, with collections um, and, uh, and observations and, and sharing experiences um, and learning from staff and students that I learned how complex um, the functioning and operation of, of a library is. Um, the, the building was opened in 1963. Um, it, were, it took about five to six years prior to that to design the building. Um, and the master planning was, was a, a decade before. So a, quite a long process of, um, of designing the building. Um, and since then, it has under, undergone a series of refurbishments and extensions. So the building was originally designed by the architect Frederick Leslie Preston from a firm called Easton Robertson and Kustain. And Howard Robertson was RIBA president, uh, Royal Institute of British Architect president in 1945. So quite a, a prominent firm to, to design this building. Uh, and also an extension was added in 1980s by uh, another renowned um, library architect, uh, Faulkner Brown. Um, and recently, um, a, a major refurbishment was completed um, by, by Stride Treglon and, and the project has been nominated for various awards. So it has got a rich design history to it. And, uh, and I hope that um, the insights that I will share, you could relate it with, with the buildings that you are based in or you're working with. Um, and if not, I would really like to hear um, other, other views. Um, uh, the way I'm I have structured this talk is, is a series of three things uh, that are required, especially since the pandemic um, and, and towards, um, towards the more kind of uh, digitally enabled future that we are heading towards. So um, the first rethink I think that, that is required is to go back and, and assess whether the trends that we, that we are seeing now are, are, are actually new or, or, or what. And so I took this, um, this um, very evocative essay um, uh, by Carlston Scott uh, called The Deserted Library. And um, during 1990s and early 2000s, the, uh, the kind of identity crisis for library was quite palpable because um, the, the PC was just uh, kind of entering the mainstream, uh, mainstream um, way of learning really and um, that really put, put a question or do we really need a, a physical building and I think that question is so relevant even even today and what I've done is I have taken some of the insights from the design of the Uni uh, University of Reading library building in 1960s and what were the things or trends they were thinking about at that time I've taken insights from uh, Scott's paper uh, to to cover that midpoint around 2000 and, and then uh, I have kind of gathered insights from current debates that are going on uh, um, around, around what we are facing now. So I'll just um, go one by one. 
So firstly, collections. 1960s, they were talking about print collections. And um, there was quite a lot of uh, discussion in the design of the library of how we are going to accommodate uh, um, lots of stock, basically. Uh, and um, whether we have um, a rolling kind of stacks which close together, it was called compact shelving. So whether we should have that or whether we should have normal stacks so that uh, users can access books um, without really um, posing any safety issues. Um, in 2001, we, we, we were kind of seeing that digital was becoming as an, as an option, really. Uh, so you have lots of print collection, but then digital is emerging. And now what we are seeing is, is preference for digital first, um, almost for, um, for uh, things like uh, journal articles, uh, textbooks for students, um, and even even ebooks. In 1960s, uh, the, the access was um, to collections was physically. You have to go there and access it. Uh, in 2000, we have we have seen that the digitization has improved the access to collection. It it has, and now. Um, it, it's kind of um, to a scale where we also have uh, digitally generated collections, so so um, collections which are generated on computer, and and uh, and so it has increased exponentially. But I think we have uh, we have become more sensitive towards the issues around digital inclusion. Um, in 1960s, there was a concern around library instruction. So whether students have uh, necessary skills to navigate the information and, and how can we support that. Um, that has kind of rephrased itself in, in the term information literacy. And um, the, the, the concern here is that students might go that if you can't find it on internet, it must not exist. And I think that this has become a much graver concern now because um, if a student cannot find it on the first page of the Google, it, ma it must not exist. So I, I think um, the attention spans have, have decreased and, and it's really information literacy has become a key issue, especially there's so much information available online and how do students navigate uh, information. I think uh, in 1960s at Reading University, the, it wasn't just chairs and tables. They had this idea of um, having a comfortable sitting area. And so there were sofas and settees to, to create that uh, comfortable environment for students. Um, in 2001, the drinks kind of made their way inside the library. And, um, it, and this was kind of seeing at bookstores and, and, and seeing that bookstores are successful because they combine coffee with books and, and give that warm, homely feeling. Um, and now I think we, we have kind of accepted uh, almost um, that uh, coffee and uh, drinks and, and, and kind of books go okay. And also we are now bringing in other kinds of spaces like maker spaces, which are more messier, so to say. Um, um, to, to work around. Um, Co-location of services has been an idea which I thought ran through all these years. Um, there was always this idea that it should be a, a place where a student can come or a user can come and find uh, different support services around them. Um, exhibitions, uh, again, is, is a trend which I thought um, has continued over, over this period of time. Um, there's also the social element of library and um, at, at University of Reading uh, uh, collection, we had a data set uh, of a questionnaire survey from 1969 and it asked students lots of questions. One of them was a free text question about um, they can write why they are at the library that day. And um, we could sense this, uh, this intent of being there for socializing, uh, also flirting and, and being seen. Um, library has been throughout these years uh, considered as central uh, to create a common academic culture or academic and, and hold together the academic community and, and to really bring that intellectual energy uh, together. So, so that is a common theme. And I think throughout my presentation, I'm going to emphasize on silent study space. And I think um, library provides a unique 
space within a campus where somebody can study silently in, in a silent environment. Um, so, so we can see that there are themes which have uh, kind of continued and themes which have evolved. And um, I think if the, the, the trends, there's lots of lessons to be learned from, from these trends uh, as we move forward. Another re thing that is required is around adaptability. And I know that this might be a key concern for a lot of you, uh, how do we adapt buildings over time? And um, my, my research suggests that it's it's kind of a continuous process. It, it's that there are things which you can, or strategies which you can build in at the initial design of the building, but those strategies might not manifest uh, 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line, because you are faced with a completely new problem. So um, I think adaptability, yes, you can think of it as at the design stage, and I will, I will, sh I will probably talk about some strategies, but I think the key takeaway is that it's it's a continuous process, and um, it's it's also quite political, and one has to negotiate to manifest uh, adaptability um, in buildings. Um, this is a concept which I think is is useful when we start thinking about um, adaptability, and to think about building as not one monolithic object, but as a series of layers. Um, and uh, so this is an idea uh, which has been developed by a workplace strategy firm, uh, DGW, whose collections are also at University of Reading. Um, and uh, what they have uh, got here is, is divided the building into layers which change at different rates of time. So for instance, the structure of the building will not change as much as say stuff, so moving around tables and um, and furniture. So, so by separating these layers and by trying to create as much less of a contact between these layers, uh, we can make a building more, more adapt adaptable. So, um, I, I tested this concept on, on a particular um, section of the library building at University of Reading and, and uh, let me show you here the oops. My mouse has disappeared. Okay, so this uh, rectangles really are uh, color coded pink and they're stuff and you can see the columns are green, the structure. And then uh, the sign color, the blue is is services. Um, and they, those are actually sockets. So in 2014, um, you can see that some tables really um, each table had an occupancy of two people on these larger ones or, or three. So uh, it was really difficult uh, to uh, have enough sockets around uh, tables so that students can put their uh, plug in their laptops. So in, uh, in the refurbishment, what was done was um, a new sockets were added here so that each uh, student on, so if there's a capacity of two students per table, each student would have a socket to put their laptop in. And um, what this really did uh, was tethered the tables to, to the services. And if we move the table slightly by even one meter, then we start seeing that some of the tables really struggle to have an accessible socket. Uh, so, so the lesson here really is that um, to, to try and create uh, this, this separation requires quite a, um, co quite a conscious decision-making process. But also I think um, sometimes it's really difficult to have this kind of separation because um, um, you don't know what the trends are going to emerge. Um, and, and sometimes you think whether the, the kind of um, resources that you put into a building to have adaptability for the future um, is, is the right approach because we don't know whether they are going to be used or not. Um, the other uh, feature about adaptability is reusing the furniture. And I, I think this is a very good example here. And it also shows that the activity of reading and studying at a desk has remained constant over years. So these tables, um, um, have been really successful since 1960, 1960s. And in 2014, you can see a small hole was drilled into this table to 
uh, to accommodate computer locks. So if students leave the desk with their, with their laptops there, they can lock it and, and go and get a book. And in 2014, um, a divider was added to create a more kind of a personal space and, and make it more uh, conducive to learning. So uh, the table as an object has survived such a long period of, of time and it has, uh, it has um, kind of upcycled itself um, and, and adapted to the practices. The other rethink that is required is around occupancy. And um, this occupancy is a very complicated matter. It's, it's, I think it's very complex than just counting number of people in a building or number of people sitting on furniture. And um, this is, this is a, the idea of territories from uh, Erwin Goffman. And he says that there, there are different sorts of territories. Um, as you, when you start looking at the interaction between people and, and uh, kind of physical spaces. So first one is stall. So it's, it's like setting up a space, um, a study space with physical boundaries around it. So for instance, carols might be a good example of that. The second territory is the you space, so the area just in front of, of you uh, and like a desk or something where, where you are using that for, for your activity. The third territory is the possessional territory. So one can imagine um, a, a desk with, with a computer. And so by occupying that desk, you are also occupying the computer. So you are occupying a lot of things around that particular space. Um, and the most important, I think, in the context of social distancing is the personal space. And he, here Goffman is thinking about uh, not a sphere around somebody, but uh, a more kind of a contour which goes and extends uh, more towards the front than towards the back. Um, so in, in my observations about how people occupy uh, seats, I found that people used to kind of sit um, one desk apart even before COVID, because that's what made them comfortable in terms of their personal space. And they and usually people don't sit just opposite other person if there are other spaces available, so that they don't have that uh, have to make that eye contact. So, so personal space, I think, is is a really important concept when we are starting to think about occupancy. And uh, we can see these different territories kind of playing out in, in the field. So for instance, here, this uh, green kind of uh, seats uh, give the effect of a stall where you have physical boundaries to, to kind of, um, um, you know, look, um, create a study area. And this is again a stall, but here, um, that th th there is a concept called marker. So uh, a user has put their, uh, their jacket to mark the space, you can see that the person is not there, but it's like, this is reserved for me. And this can be an issue in libraries where a lot of um, uh, marking happens and, and as, a as a result, students are not able to find study space because people have left their things around to mark that we, it's in use. Um, but this creates a, a kind of a, a completely uh, enclosed um, uh, private space. Here, somebody has kind of uh, turned the two of this uh, seats around, and here we can see that the possessional space has expanded not just to the to this particular seat and the table, but also to the next seat, the seat next to it. So the the space has kind of expanded, and again here somebody has taken a bin, which is not part of the of the kind of um, study space setup, uh, but again it becomes part of the possessional space. Um, this is the, here we can see the personal space. So they're sitting side by side quite comfortably, uh, but if they were to sit, and this comes to the contour idea, which is more towards the front of, of somebody. So they are, they probably know each other and they feel it's comfortable to sit together to, to work on, on something. Um, going forward, probably because of, if they are in part of a bubble, maybe that's acceptable, but I think um, social distancing would mean um, this might not be acceptable. I, I also did a, a, a furniture use study, which uh, I think some of you might be familiar with the term sweeping survey, but I went around the building and I plotted uh, four times a day for a week 
and I plotted uh, how many students are sitting on a particular piece of furniture and any kind of um, unique behavior patterns that I see. For instance, um, somebody is sitting uh, in, in a closed uh, glass pod, which I'll show with the headphones on, uh, which is supposed to be a collaborative space. So they need to be talking and discussing, but they are working with their headphones on. So, um, and what I found that even during the times when uh, when there were the, when the occupancy was peak, and here you can see um, I, oh I should mention this first. So so the orange things really show when the occupancy is less than twenty five percent. So if it's a it's a table of four, only one person is occupying it. So uh, point twenty uh, if there is a one blue dot, then it shows that it's between twenty five to fifty percent. Uh, if it's two blue dots, it shows between point uh, between 50 and 75 percent. And if it's green, then it's more than 75 percent. So there are likely to be three or four people occupying that four place table. And what we can see here is that uh, these green pods were were extremely popular and they were uh, used um, used the most um, on, on that particular floor. And that's because it provided that uh, individual private uh, study area. Um, and then, and this is uh, another piece of furniture, uh, which you can see, and I'll show you a picture, but you can see that, that that's kind of highly underutilized. And it's this particular pod where there is a table of six people uh, in a glass enclosure, which was extremely popular. So if we go back, uh, it was not that nobody used it, people used it, but it wasn't used by six people um, or, or to five or six people, the maximum occupancy. And what we found is that uh, the maximum group size was um, was five and the most frequent group size was uh, two or three people. So in the next uh, phase of refurbishment, um, what was done was that instead of having six, a table of six, uh, Two of such pods were provided with a capacity of four. And I think um, that that served um, student needs perfect because they were looking for something which is enclosed, uh, but but for the for the kind of smaller two, three to four um, members uh, of a group. But also uh, another uh, policy was introduced, and, and this is quite interesting because adaptability of a building doesn't really mean that we need to have some physical changes made to the building, but also softer instruments like policy can be used to adapt building to, to so for instance, in this case, increasing demand. Um, there, there was a temporal territory created, so you can occupy the space only for, say, two hours maximum. And, uh, and this is another way to kind of manage, uh, uh, manage demand, which has, which has, I think, um, little to do with the physical space, uh, but more kind of using a softer policy instrument. But I think territories of, of a study space aren't just um, limited to, to a particular piece of furniture. Uh, they, they expand, and they expand to um, somebody's accommodation and other study spaces within a campus. So for instance, um, this particular table space, um, one might not find in their accommodation because they have put books on, and lots of stuff there. So if they need a clean desk to work, uh, they might have to come to the library. Uh, lighting, um, it's, it's a big issue uh, to have good lighting and um, the space might offer that. Um, other, seeing other people. So um, again, if you are in your accommodation, you, you, you won't be able to see other people. And when you come to the library, you kind of uh, see more people. There's no bed, and I think bed, uh, we are doing some re, um, kind of um, uh, student assignment around how architecture students are coping during pandemic. And we have found a bed in their accommodation to be very distracting object. And um, just having no bed, no bed around you can be, can be a useful thing. Uh, no eating and drinking. I mean, at this, this piece of research was done when uh, coffees weren't allowed in, in the library building. It was in early 2012. Um, but now I think uh, you can drink coffee um, and, and um, possibly eat some snacks as well. Um, 
no TV or YouTube, um, because there's also this kind of peer-to-peer uh, um, -peer review. If you are watching YouTube in, in the study space, um, you, you are kind of under pressure to, to be thought of as not working. Um, so that's also useful. So I think I, I just wanted to mention that the space in the library is always as a complement and as a contrast to other spaces around um, campus and uh, in accommodations. Uh, so it's it's part of a unique part of students' uh, learning journey. Um, the other thing we think we, we, we need is around exhibitions. And um, I think exhibitions are such a powerful tool um, and um, we probably need more engagement of uh, students and uh, and academics to, uh, especially from uh, from disciplines which are not arts and humanities, to kind of engage with exhibitions. Um, and um, I would bring in Guy here, but this um, this at University of Reading Library um, we had a, we have packet collection which Guy will tell more about, but it emerged out of one exhibition in 1970s. So um, by curating that exhibition, uh, the whole kind of um, um, collection emerged over time. Guy, you will tell better about this. Yeah, so so thanks, Hiral. So yeah, essentially, I think what you said earlier, you used the term um, intellectual energy, and I think that's exactly what this was about. It wasn't, it's, you shouldn't think of this as an exhibition. This was the, the kind of catalyst for and kind of focus of a huge outpouring of intellectual energy around um, Samuel Beckett, the, the Nobel Prize winning playwright. And um, uh, the exhibition was the start of this, but it led to, to us building up this huge collection of Beckett material, having a research centre, having an international foundation. There, but, it, but it wasn't just an exhibition either. Although the, so the library was a kind of a focus, very much a focus for this because of its ability to, to, to do several things, to have a space, but also to have people who could curate an exhibition and who could then hold the collection that was built up in the kind of wake of that. Um, so yeah, there were lots and lots of aspects of the library that kind of fed into that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's a really kind of interesting example. It's really interesting to revisit it. Um, last year um, and, and actually look again at, at um, with the anniversary of that exhibition about how that had been done and, and the kind of central role of the library as a space and as a, as a, as a team in, in making that happen. I'll, I'll be quiet now and get, get back to you, Hural. Great, thank you. Um, and I think it, it, the, the library design from uh, the original design had this exhibition halls as, as integral part of it. And they had to actually defend um, because that was considered to be an open area and part of circulation in terms of the metrics. And the architects had to had to defend, um, and even the librarians had to defend um, that, you know, this is an important part of the of the library and even if that means that it increases the area of circulation in terms of numbers um, we should not be kind of um, you know we should not put this idea away so they actually fought for having uh, this exhibition hall um, in, 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 the, in the original design um, so. Yes, and I think um, another rethink that is required is around a civic mission of, of universities and uh, more, more so as, um, as we move forward in, in the fourth industrial revolution uh, um, where, we, where universities would, uh, would play a key role in upskilling local community and, uh, and um, kind of in, in a knowledge-based economy where they can provide um, a resource to to local community to to kind of um, access knowledge um, and and also digital inclusion in this um, because this is a quote from uh, older people's commissioner for Wales report uh, recent report and um, they have found that older people especially struggled uh, with finding access to internet uh, due to the closures of libraries so um, I think um, it's just not the, the younger uh, generations that a library serves, um, especially students and, and uh, people who are, who are just uh, embarking work. Um, but it's also the um, older people and, and the, that community which, uh, which, is quite, which can benefit quite a lot from, from the library uh, buildings, especially within universities. 
And here I have an example, um, a very powerful example, I think, of Hive at uh, Worcester. Um, and it's, it's the first joint public and university library in Europe. And I think the, probably this is uh, one of the future typologies of library buildings where um, the, a library isn't just serving the university or academic community, but it's serving a much broader local community. But there will be implications on space demand. Um, and there will be implications on collection strategies, because if there is a book on the shelf, probably somebody could, a member of public could go and access it. But if it's uh, it's uh, a digital um, ebook that has to be accessed via university username, that creates an issue around access. So how do we negotiate, um, negotiate with publishers uh, to open up access? Uh, to collections is, is another kind of issue. An IT strategy, because um, members of public might really want to use a computer or, or internet, and how do we allow for that, uh, not just access to the physical infrastructure of the library, but also the digital infrastructure of, of a library. And I think the major, and, and, and this is one of the kind of quite key uh, rethink is what is a library. And um, this is a quote uh, from 1999. Um, and again, it says, it's so relevant today. It says the next great library debate may be over space. And I mean, this is something that I can say that, that today as well, um, that the next great debate would be over space. And so um, it, when the uh, Red, University of Reading Library was being designed, there is a scribble uh, um, by Vice Chancellor. Um, and he, he's kind of asking the question, what is a library? Is it, uh, is it a book stack or is it a reading space for users? And I would say, is it a place for, for exhibitions? And so I think it's, it's the identity of the library has always been contested and um, it's more so it's it's going to be um, contested in future. And um, what was quite um, quite insightful for me was that um, the one of the identities of the library was around a boundary to to kind of um, manage uh, ingoings and out so incomings and outgoings of books. And uh, here you can see the example of a book which has got um, marks from all the different systems over time. So for instance, there were stamps to begin with in 1960s, and then uh, there was punch card at one point for the issuing of the books, and then came the, the barcode, and now there is RFID kind of um, a tag attached to it. So I think um, all these different systems uh, show that one of the key element of a library's identity is around creating and maintaining that boundary. And so um, I think in in future, we, we might need to think, especially with the digital collection, how do we define that boundary and how does that impact on the identity of the library? Um, th this is the, uh, the, the photographs of the exhibition hall that, that I mentioned earlier. And it was uh, it used to curate a lot of exhibition in 1960s, but as student numbers increased and and the print uh, stock increased, the exhibition hall had to be taken over to create study space as well as to to put books, uh, which meant that it became really difficult to organize this large scale exhibitions. However, because um, a, we now have lots of um, sharing agreements between universities for print collections, as well as um, we have a, a digital resources, meant that we could free up this area to, to go back again and create it uh, as an uh, uh, as an exhibition space. So, so there has been, uh, and this idea around ontological politics is from Anne-Marie Moll. Um, and it's really about what is library and the constant politics that goes on between uh, leveraging one version of a library over other and how the physical building is, is kind of um, embroiled in that, in that politics. And so sometimes it's, even if the physical building uh, or physical aspects of the building are adaptable, there might be other kind of social aspects which mean that we are not able to adapt a building. Um, and so I think that one of the key takeaways that I would like uh, from you um, 
li like uh, for you is to think about library buildings as not this fixed object, but as socio-material practices. And by socio-material, I mean uh, the interaction between people and things and, and, and practices, which means that the building is always evolving and always changing. Um, at this point, I would um, I would mention a few ideas around library building futures, and I would also encourage you to share your views on the Padlet link. Um, and I'll quick, go through them fairly quickly. So the first one is around connections. And so uh, library is quite uh, central to create intellectual connections between disciplines, and it's an antidisciplinary space. Uh, the material connections between uh, books and objects and lots of different artifacts, the social connections between uh, not just students and staff, but also the members of public, um, and the special connections between different spaces that become part of a user journey. Um, library is unique, and I think the future library buildings should um, cherish this um, uniqueness about have providing silent study space, because I think um, there has been a lot of noise around collaborative study spaces. And I think um, this survey from HEDQF in 2019 shows that students find silent group study spaces most difficult uh, um, to find on campus. So this is something quite unique to the, to the identity of the library, which, um, which needs to be cherished, I think. Um, we would see that more and more, uh, especially to, to address the carbon agenda, um, the, the demand in terms of uh, library spaces would mean not adding extensions, but uh, maybe reusing some of the existing spaces across the campus um, to, provide the studies, to provide study space. And I think the challenge there is to create that holistic identity around uh, library, which is dispersed across spaces. And so that means curating the experience of, um, of what of the library across this multiple spaces, um, and also the architectural quality of acoustics, comfort, um, the, the kind of furniture and natural light, I think is, is important. But also amenities like study resources and um, access to library staff and food and drinks uh, would be important to, to be addressed if we are starting to disperse uh, the library across different spaces on campus. Um, and I think if coming from a built environment uh, point of view, um, it's it's a more uh, of a note to, to myself as well as I think for you as clients to start thinking about uh, a building project, um, the before and the after of the building project. So um, if we think about before it's continuous briefing and how do we um, make sure that we are continuously engaging with users through not just before the building project, throughout the building project, but also after the building project. Um, and um, again, there is a, a third edition of this book that I'm involved in, and we are really excited um, to, to bring this idea or refresh this idea again in current context, especially COVID-19, um, post-COVID-19 context. Um, and if, if you would like to get involved in that, just, just get in touch um, uh, in, in that book. Um, the second thing is around continuous post-occupancy evaluation and post-occupancy evaluations tend to be a snapshot of, um, of a library just maybe one year or two years or three years after a building has been finished. But I think uh, what is required is that continuous uh, evaluating the building uh, over time, but also changing the criteria as we go along because um, the criteria become outdated as well. So um, I think it's it's that continuous feedback loop from from how a building is functioning to to making interventions and then uh, and then testing it again. Um, I would also suggest that user insights are drawn both from qualitative and quantitative methods. And by quantitative, I just don't mean uh, statistics, but I also mean big data. And um, again, there's interesting uh, kind of complementarity between small data, which is highly qualitative, uh, in-depth, and big data, and, and they both can, can 
when combined together can be really powerful. Um, but I think um, engaging more with this user research uh, would, would help in creating a better library service and not just better building. Um, and this is an interesting insight um, to have a, a person, a custodian for building culture and behavior uh, from Harriet Short's research here. Uh, and that means that somebody who, uh, who curates events uh, and kind of um, manages space or constantly aligns space with library services and can feed back into the briefing process and the evaluation process. So somebody who is not just looking at facilities management perspective or health and safety perspective, but taking that more kind of a building a culture or a community around the building. Um, and that kind of role might become increasingly important as we as we have to uh, kind of um, work across this digital and the physical environment. So the future, uh, the, the library uh, can be extremely functional. Uh, it can be a house of natural light, exhilarating experience, and a lesson in the use of space, proportion, light, and art of the building. And uh, this was uh, what was mentioned in the speech uh, when Frederick Plesley Preston, the architect of University of Library, um, University of Reading Library was awarded an honorary doctorate at the opening of the library building. And I think this uh, is so relevant even today. Um, so thank you for listening to me. I am looking forward to your questions. And um, if you want to get in touch, uh, please, please do so. Thank you so much, Sherelle. That was so interesting. And um, I've been making furious and copious notes during that. Um, so relevant to, to what lots of us are, are going through at the moment. Um, I'm going to start with a question, which um, is, is something differently in the UK, I think a lot of us are focused on, which is um, with obviously the pandemic at the moment, our study spaces are, are quite reduced in our libraries. So at York, for instance, where I am, we've gone from about 1300 spaces to about 350 within the library. Obviously, in order to meet student demand and things, we're looking at um, what other spaces could we use across the university. And really interested in your point that you just made around how we create and curate um, that library experience and that library identity across those spaces. Um, and having looked at um, some of your uh, publications before this, um, that learn the learning space compass framework that you've developed, I wondered if you thought that might be something helpful helpful and, and practical that we could use in, in terms of looking at this? Yes, no, thank you for, uh, for highlighting that learning space compass framework. And um, just to give a big bit of a background to that, uh, that was part of a consultancy project for higher education design quality forum, which is a client forum within UK. Um, and it's it, what they wanted what, or what they have seen, uh, and especially experts in the field had seen, was that uh, th th there was a lack of a common language between academics and architects. And there, there were not many occasions when academics got the chance to sit together with architects to discuss pedagogies, curriculum, and how that might align to space. And uh, so the learning space compass is really to fill that gap where you can, you can use that method, methodology to have a session or a workshop. Um, and it's not just for briefing new buildings, it's also for ongoing management of space. So you can sit down with, uh, with somebody from estates and an architect and yourself, and you can see, okay, these are the different learning activities that we want to, uh, want to include. How can we align the space best to it? So coming back to your question, as we are seeing more of a dispersed um, library experience, it could actually say, okay, what are the different activities that uh, we want to encourage um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of enhancing student learning? And so, okay, what, can, what are the different spatial characteristics that we, um, that we need to focus on? And that can give uh, a, an output which you can use to either have intervention, small refurbishment projects, or, or maybe just policy-based interventions might be needed. So, so again, it's a useful tool and, and I'm currently doing a project on it where we are, we are developing it as a toolkit, which um, 
which academics can use for their uh, for designing their blended learning. Uh, because uh, what is increasingly becoming important is the question: what should be delivered face to face versus online uh, versus online. And so, um, we, if you if you would like to learn more about that or get involved in developing that toolkit, just get in touch. Um, but more on that will follow over the next uh, two to three months. Great, thank you. There was also a, a question about um, the pods which you um, uh, showed at Reading um, that were designed for six people and you talked about the policies around that. Um, and I think Guy's going to ask the specific, answer the specific question, sorry, about how, how that was managed if they weren't bookable, how that two hours was enforced. But I actually had a, a slightly different question for you, which was, did you look at the, the kind of self-management of space as kind of part of the study that you did? Um, by self-management, um, I mean, uh, so self-management could pan out in the sense that um, if there were a couple of items lying around, uh, would students uh, remove that and, and kind of take over that space, which students didn't normally do. But um, I think uh, a few years later, University of Reading Library uh, created a campaign where they said, if you are finding space uh, which has been uh, left left marked and unoccupied for, for a long time, just get in touch with us and we will remove them and make that space available. Uh, so, so, and I think th that kind of um, marking of space was used by groups quite a lot. And again, we have to think from the student perspective because students don't have home bases um, in, on campus. So they are moving around with quite a lot of uh, weight in terms of their laptop, their books and stuff, and they have got to go to a session here for an hour or a session there for an hour. And so um, what they did was one of the one of their friends would sit on a table and look after everybody's stuff while everybody's going everywhere and then come back. So again, from student perspective, I think it, it demonstrates the lack of home bases on, on campus. Yeah, yeah, so just on the specifics, it's, just, it's very similar to what Hiral said, and thanks to my colleague Sue, who's in the audience and answered really quickly to give me the definitive answer, which is that the, the, it's a reactive um, enforcement of that. So if someone, um, if a student complains and says we can't get in a space because these people have been in there for four hours, then library staff would intervene. Thanks very much, Guy, and thanks, Harrell. The next question is about, um, uh, obviously, you talked about the hive at, at Worcester, and um, there's a question about um, whether you've done any comparative review of multifunctional spaces, like the Learning Hub at the University of Northampton, where enclosed spaces are teaching or offices, and the open spaces tend to be library spaces across a big room, uh, across a big building, sorry. Um. I haven't done a, a, such a comparative study, but what I have done is I've looked into a uh, workplace sector. Uh, so where offices uh, and offices for different organizations and how different organizations need different kind of offices. So for instance, an open plan office might not work for certain kind of organizations uh, like a legal uh, profession where confidentiality is a big part of it. Um, so, uh, but open plan might work perfectly well for a financial services organization because they need to see each other and they need to pass on nonverbal non cues. Um, so, uh, the, the, I would like to kind of comment on that that there is um, a need to look at what actually happens in terms of what are the practices or activities that are happening within any organization and whether the spaces are corresponding to that or if there are ways in which we can enhance some of those uh, spaces to better align with, with what's happening in the organization. I don't know if you, I answered the question right, but uh, do, uh, do ask me a follow on question if this wasn't what you were expecting. Thanks, Harold. No, I think that's fine. I'm going to um, uh, move on to a question about uh, EDI next. And obviously, it's something that lots of us, again, are thinking about, and not just the minimum legal requirements, but actually how we provide a, a quality user experience. Um, and just um, wondering if your research has come up with any key findings or recommendations, um, including accommodating the digital shift within uh, the kind of the space itself. 
Yes, I mean, um, accessibility is is one of the key issues. Um, one of the things which needs to be considered is, is the book stacks and the spacing between the book stacks uh, so that a wheelchair user is, is able to access them. And if, especially if they're high, how do we support them, whether somebody accompanies with them uh, when they are navigating? Because browsing is such a, uh, such a unique experience and it's, it's quite, um, I think it's quite an intellectual experience to browse through different uh, books, especially for humanities. Um, and so uh, I think it's it's access to to book stacks, but also um, I know th uh, that uh, in my study of uh, furniture spaces, I found that um, if libraries open longer hours, uh, some of the some of my female participants they prefer to sit in an open area so that um, it's they felt more safer. So I think it's also about that element of safety um, around, uh, around different genders. Um, I mean, Reading University Library has tried mixed gender uh, kind of um, washrooms and it has been an interesting experience, uh, but I'm, I'm not well placed to comment on that because I, I finished my research by then, but, um, Maybe uh, Guy or Sue uh, in the audience might be able to comment on that. Um, but again, I think it's um, digital, like I mentioned, it's about uh, digital inclusion also involves access to physical infrastructure. Uh, and I think that is something to, to bear in mind that it's about accessing the Wi-Fi network, accessing collections on 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 the computers um, which are located in the library uh, for a member of public I think those are those are the kind of things that that matter did you want to comment did I think I'm um, Sue, Sue's updated to say gender neutral toilets but yeah. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add guy uh, no, sorry, I'll have to, I'll have to, I, I haven't got anything to add on that one, but Thank I, I don't you. know if we've got time for another one. I, th I think I'm just going to um, ask one very final thing, which is really just to draw everyone's attention back to the Padlet, where there's some fantastic um, postcards coming in that, Harrell, I'm sure you haven't had a chance to look at yet, so you'll be able to look at them after this. Um, I'm not sure you can answer this very, um, uh, you know, in the time that we've got left, but there is a question about, in your opinion, what makes a library a library um, and so I think you can have a cop out here of saying you've put some postcards on there already with ideas but I don't know if there's anything you want to say kind of finally just before we wrap up. Yes I, I mean um, the, the, the answer in one sentence is that there are a lot of things that make library a library there's not one thing and some of them I have put in the postcard but again if you go go and look at my chapter, um, this building is never finished. It has got a, a triangle there which says what are the different things that make a library a library. So you will have to read my chapter for that. 